Hello and welcome to tonight's lecture added by the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. I'm your host, Naim Mahmoud. Tonight, we are to have the third lecture of the series Applied Multiplexity, Ibn Khaldun as an example. The aim of the series is to understand Ibn Khaldun's multiplex approach to social science. The title of tonight's lecture is Ibn Khaldun on Knowledge, Multiplex Epistemology. The lecturer is Professor Dr. Rajab Shantuk. Professor Dr. Rajab Shantuk is the Dean of the College of Islamic Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. He was the former founding president of Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. He holds a PhD from Columbia University's Department of Sociology and specializes in civilizational studies, sociology, and Islamic studies with focus on social networks, human rights, and modernization in the Muslim world. He served as a researcher at the Center for Islamic Studies in Istanbul and is the founding director of Alliance of Civilizations Institute. He is the head of International Ibn Khaldun Society and has a seat in the editorial boards of multiple academic journals. Among his books are, in English, Narrative Social Structure, Hadith Transmission Network, 610 to 1505, and in Turkish, open civilization towards a multi-civilizational society and world. Ibn Khaldun, contemporary readings, Malcolm X, struggle for human rights, and social memory, how this transmission network, 610 to 1505. Professor Dr. Rajiv Shanturk's work has been translated to Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish. So that is the uh, brief short intro of tonight's lecture. A few words about the format. The lecture will take roughly around 30 to 45 minutes, and it will be then followed by comments and Q&A section, which will last around 30 to 45 minutes as well. We observe few rules. We ask our audience to keep mic and mobile muted until told otherwise. We encourage questions and discussions focused on the lecture only. We also encourage attendees to take notes on the lecture for the comments and Q&A section. So now, without further ado, I'd like to ask Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantuk to deliver the lecture. Professor, over to you. And okay. yeah, you could share the screen if you if you'd like. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Salam alaikum, uh, everyone. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, Ibn Khaldun views uh, regarding uh, knowledge, uh, which I describe as multiplex uh, epistemology. By multiplex, I mean multi-layered uh, epistemology. As I will uh, explain, you know, he accepts different layers of uh, knowledge, different types of uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, and this is in Arabic called Maratibul Ulum. So he is one of the representatives of Maratibul Ulum. And actually, all our ulama who lived in the past, all our philosophers, you know, they accept this uh, multiplex epistemology, uh, Maratibul uh, Ulum. So we study Ibn Khaldun as an example for multiplex uh, epistemology. And the purpose of this series is to demonstrate how multiplexity is implemented in uh, social research. Uh, so Ibn Haldun uh, is just an example. Uh, it should not be misunderstood uh, as if he's the only one who uses uh, uh, multiplexity. Uh, in this presentation, I uh, benefited from two books of uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun. One of them is his Muqaddimah, and the other is Shifa Usail, the Tehsibil Mesail. So, Muqaddimah is a well known book, doesn't need any introduction. Uh, Ibn Khaldun talks about epistemology in that book. So, uh, I uh, utilized uh, that book and also. Shifa Usail is another book on uh, Tasawuf written by uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun. 
Şifa usaili tehsibil mesail. It means remedy of the questioner in search of uh, answers. So these two books are very uh, important. Uh, of course, he has uh, other books which may also be incorporated uh, uh, when we search deeply his, uh, his views on epistemology. But these are the two major sources because uh, Shifa Usail reflects his, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his views uh, from a Tasawuf uh, perspective. And, uh, and Mukaddime, uh, as you know, it's an empirical work uh, in, uh, in civilization uh, studies. Uh, uh, so these two books uh, demonstrate the multiplicity of his uh, epistemology in particular. And he's very conscious uh, about this uh, multiplexity. Uh, he wrote in the sixth chapter of his Mukaddime uh, about uh, man and his ability to reason, uh, to uh, exercise fikir. Uh, so Ibn Khaldun, uh, uh, in the sixth chapter of uh, Mukaddime, seeks an answer to the question of what's a human being. Uh, because uh, all sciences, uh, deal with a human being and his uh, actions. Uh, so that's why it's very important, you know, to answer this question. And actually, all uh, social theories are grounded uh, on a particular understanding of uh, uh, of, uh, of 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 human being. Uh, uh, so the the content, subject, purpose, and scope of uh, sciences can only be understood by answering the question of what a human being is. Uh, so this is Ibn Khaldun's uh, perspective, uh, and it's very clear there. Uh, uh, we have already discussed Ibn Khaldun's view on existence, on multiplex uh, ontology, and how he operationalizes multiplex uh, ontology. Uh, he, uh, here in this lecture, we will be talking about how he operationalizes uh, multiplex uh, epistemology. So the uh, ontological hierarchy is parallel to epistemological hierarchy. You see this uh, parallelism uh, between uh, multiplex approach to existence and multiplex approach to uh, knowledge. Uh, because epistemology is grounded on ontology. Uh, and this is also uh, observable in Ibn Khaldun's uh, uh, writings. Uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, there are three types of knowledge that correspond to three levels of existence. According to his multiplex uh, epistemology, Meratibul Ilim, there are three types of knowledge. Uh, acquired knowledge, knowledge granted by divine inspiration, gifted knowledge, we can say gifted knowledge, and then the prophetic knowledge, knowledge of the messengers of uh, Allah Ta'ala. As we discussed in the previous lecture, Ibn Haldun accepts that there is material world, alim al mulk or alim al shahada and then there is non-material world, alim al malakut or alim al ghaib and also the divine world, alim al lahut So acquired knowledge, it's called al-ilm al kasbi it is gained through reasoning uh, or research. Uh, this is the scientific knowledge, academic uh, knowledge produced by research, reasoning. And it's called uh, al-ilm al kasbi acquired knowledge. People acquire it by studying, by doing research. Uh, the second type of uh, knowledge uh, this is the gifted knowledge. You know, it's granted by God. Uh, you know, it uh, comes to people through divine inspiration, uh, kashf, uh, or ilham. The active faculty is the human heart. Uh, 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 this kind of knowledge is not gained through rational processes in the mind, but is granted by Allah to pious people as a reward. Uh, uh, and uh, in the Quran, uh, there is a verse clearly uh, demonstrates this. 
Fettakullah feyuallimkumullah. So have takwa, then Allah will teach you. So takwa brings a, a, a particular type of knowledge to uh, people. But in order to have takwa, you need al ilm al kesbi. And if you have takwa, then you will be blessed with uh, al marifa al wahbiya, uh, the gifted knowledge uh, uh, taught by God. Uh, and then there is uh, another very special type of knowledge, which is al ilm al nabawi, knowledge of the messengers of Allah Taala, which is only accessible to prophets and can be received through divine revelation. Uh, wahi, uh, law. Uh, so these uh, three types of uh, knowledge uh, uh, is accepted by Ibn Khaldun as part of Maratib al-Ilm, multiplex uh, epistemology, because Ilm Kesbi has a different epistemology. Uh, Al-Ilm al-Wahbi has another uh, epistemology, and Ilm al-Nabawi, the knowledge of the prophets, has another different type of uh, epistemology. So it's a good example of his understanding uh, of uh, multiplex uh, epistemology. Uh, uh, multiplex epistemology uh, uh, is adopted by all uh, Muslim scholars. And Ibn Khaldun is not exceptional uh, to this. And this multiplex epistemology is grounded on multiplex uh, ontology. Uh, and uh, from this perspective, the uh, different types of uh, knowledge, they are uh, structured in this uh, multiplex uh, system. So there are two types of knowledge, the objective source of knowledge, uh, and it includes uh, sense perception, Al Hawas al Salima, and then reason, Al Akl al Salim, and then revelation and true reports, Al Khabar al Sadiq. So these are three, three objective sources of knowledge. When I say objective, I mean uh, an argument may be based on these uh, sources of knowledge in the public sphere. You can use them in the court, in the uh, school, or in any public debate to prove something. Uh, in the West, uh, you know, there are rationalists who give priority to reason, and there are empiricists who give uh, priority to sense perception, and then the religious pious people, you know, they give priority to wahi. But here you see all of them are uh, given equal importance uh, in this uh, system. Then we have subjective sources of knowledge uh, from the perspective of uh, multiplex uh, epistemology or maratib ilim These subjective sources of knowledge include intuition, dreams, inspirations, and opening of the eye of the heart. Kashf. Hats, ru'ya, ilham, kashf. But these are subjective. By subjective, I mean that uh, this, the knowledge gained through these uh, sources cannot be used uh, as a foundation for an argument in the public sphere. Uh, in the court, you cannot use it. Uh, when you make fatwa uh, in fiqh, you cannot use them as delil. You cannot use them to show that one hadith is sahih based on this. Uh, you cannot use in academic research, you cannot use in any public debate. It's private uh, to you. I mean, if you see something in your dream, if you like to accept it, you accept it. If you don't like to accept it, you don't accept it. But you cannot use your dream as an evidence to prove something to other uh, people. So this is a very comprehensive uh, epistemology, as you see, that uh, it includes both like a you know a sense perception reason divine revelation in the scriptures uh, and also intuition dreams inspiration opening uh, of the uh, heart's eye it's a very comprehensive uh, but the problem is how to use them all together without transgressing the borders uh, uh, so uh, it's the muslim scholars they define the domain where it's 
uh, acceptable to your sense perception. And usually it is the material world, alem -e mulk which is the physical world. Uh, but the reason may also be used uh, both in the material world, but uh, in uh, if you if one wants to use reason, you know, to do research about the metaphysical world, uh, this is epistemological transgression. Uh, like uh, you cannot know uh, like the hereafter through your reason. I mean, you can know its existence, but you cannot do details of it. Uh, like how is life in paradise? Your reason or your sense perception are not going to help you. You need divine revelation uh, for this uh, purpose. Uh, so this is how the multiplex epistemological system in general works and it's accepted commonly by all our thinkers and uh, scholars. Uh, so Ibn Haldun pays attention to the man's ability uh, to think. And uh, he argues that sense perception uh, is common to both animals and people. You know? So this is something we share. They have eyes, we also have eyes. They have ears, we also have ears. You know, uh, so this is common to both animals and human beings. Uh, uh, man has the advantage over the other beings that he may perceive things outside himself through his ability to think, fikr, which is something beyond his senses. So this fikr, you know, does not exist in the animals. Uh, it is something peculiar to us, to human beings. Uh, through the internal senses of the mind, man takes the picture of the immediate objects of sense perception. Uh, so uh, like when we see something, we take that image. Uh, so this is how our uh, sense perception works. Uh, so that's the uh, surat, that's the image of uh, something or the concept uh, of it. Uh, the ability to think is the occupation with mental images that are beyond sense perception and the application of the mind to them for analysis and synthesis. So this is thinking. Okay, so you have concepts which you drive through your observation of the material objects uh, and nature. And when you, uh, you know, discover relations, uh, between these uh, concepts, then this is thinking. And if you discover a new relationship between those concepts, this becomes like a new uh, idea. Uh, so our mind uh, makes analysis, makes synthesis by bringing those concepts together and uh, separating them. Uh, and this is what is meant by the word for art. For ad, it also means heart. Uh, so there's kalp and there's fuad, you know, uh, synonyms, the same uh, meaning. So uh, human beings think with their spiritual hearts, with their kalp, with their fuad. It's the same thing. So uh, our akal is in the heart, you know, in uh, yeah. an akal is something spiritual something uh, non-material, and it's a faculty of the kalp. So there are different uh, levels of thinking. Uh, according to Ibn Khaldun, the ability to think has different uh, uh, levels and uh, several degrees. Al-Aql uh, al-Tamyizi, this is discretionary thinking, discretionary thinking, or thinking to separate things from each other. So it is intellectual understanding of the things that exist in the outside world. Uh, and it produces concepts. Like you see trees, you have the concept of tree. You see uh, chickens, then you have the concept of chicken. You see uh, roads, you have the concept of road in your mind. And these are called concepts in Arabic, tasawurat. And with uh, concepts, man knows what's useful, what's harmful. That's the elementary level of knowledge. Then al-aql al-tajribi, this is exp 
experiential uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, it provides uh, men with ideas and the behavior needed in dealing with his fellow men and in leading them in uh, politics. Uh, so politics is an experiential knowledge you know, derived from the experience of uh, people and uh, politics and or al aql tajrubi or experiential knowledge uh, is grounded in tasdikat propositions and a proposition or a judgment uh, is constituted by two tasawurat two concepts and the relationship uh, between them uh, al aql nazari the third type of uh, thinking this is the theoretical thinking. Uh, it provides the knowledge of an object beyond sense perception without any practical uh, activity. So this, uh, this Akhtu Nazari is about Kulliyat, uh, uh, the universal categories or universal uh, knowledge uh, or the general uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, so it consists uh, of both concepts to tasawurat and uh, also the judgment tasdik tasdik yeah, tasawurat and uh, tasdik this is the uh, more complicated uh, sophisticated type of uh, thinking which is uh, unique to uh, human beings al uh, aklun nazari and nazar is defined as moving from uh, particulars to the uh, universals uh, uh, so uh, like with your with sense perception people experience and perceive particulars through nazar they reach to kulliyat the the general uh, knowledge uh, um human beings uh, they have intellectual uh, capacity but this intellectual capacity has levels so Ibn Khaldun calls like the lowest level, Bashariya, the second middle level, Ruhaniya, and the highest level, al malakiya So a human being uh, in the beginning of his life, uh, like uneducated uh, person, is at the level of Bashariya. Then after some education and uh, learning, he may come to the level of Ruhaniya, and uh, above the level of Ruhaniya, there is uh, Malakiya. And he uh, sees a parallelism between the animal kingdom, human beings, and the angels. Uh, so uh, like human beings begin their journey when they are born like animals. Uh, they are after only satisfying their uh, physical needs. Uh, then slowly they improve and become like human uh, beings, uh, and they are different than the, uh, uh, than the, uh, they become different than uh, animals. Uh, so even Haldun calls this level of Ruhaniya. But if they go further, then they reach the level of uh, Melekiya. So you see that uh, you know, in uh, Ibn Haldun's view, uh, existing beings, they are organized in ascending uh, order human soul is prepared to reach the higher and the final level of malakiya by virtue of a primary natural position that god has placed in uh, human uh, soul uh, but this requires you know education and improvement uh, so human soul is the knower the knower is the human soul the heart is in the soul, the, 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 uh, and the, and also the reason is in the soul. So these are all faculties of the of human uh, soul. Uh, uh, but, but human soul uh, uses reason and sense perception as its tools. Uh, so Allah created human soul with two facets. Right, Ibn Khaldun, writes Ibn Khaldun, one side is turned towards sensory experience, al arjud al hissi, you know, the existence that can be 
can be perceived through uh, sense perception. Uh, from it, the soul draws the forms of the existence, the concepts, the images, which are then brought by the senses to the intellect, Ako, where their abstract meanings are disengaged. Uh, the other facet uh, of, uh, of uh, human beings, they are turned towards the tablet, Allah al mahfuz which is in Alam al ghaib uh, So on the one hand, we are grounded in the physical empirical world, but on the other hand, we are connected to Alam al ghaib the invisible world, uh, uh, where, wherein the forms of the existence are impressed and include knowledge of the realities that have been, are, and will be. Until the day of resurrection, there is a veil between human soul and the uh, tablet. Uh, so if this veil between human soul, which is the thinking and reasoning faculty of a human being, uh, is uh, removed, tablet becomes the lawh al-mahfuz, uh, becomes visible to human beings. Uh, uh, so if the veil is lifted through purification and deliverance from impurities, the sins, then perception idrak is achieved in its most perfect aspect, uh, more preferably so than by means of the first facet. Indeed, the senses, the imagination, and the intellect cannot always be relied upon to transmit faithfully, faithfully the forms and realities of the existence to the human soul. This is because senses know the particulars and reason universalizes that uh, particulars. This universalization or abstraction is knowing behind the veil. Uh, uh, multiplex uh, epistemology uh, recognizes that uh, different types of knowledge, they have advantages and limitations. That's why you cannot rely on a single source of knowledge. Uh, you cannot rely on a single type of knowledge uh, uh, because every type of knowledge, every source of knowledge has limitations. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so reason is limited, that's why Prophetic knowledge, wahi is needed to support uh, reason. But at the same time, prophetic knowledge is not enough in itself alone. You have to use your reason, which is required by the wahi, by divine knowledge, by the Quran. Not all existing things and their causes are accessible to human mind and senses. Some aspects of the reality lie beyond the al-aql and human comprehension. The train of prophetic knowledge is beyond the intellect and it informs us about the higher level of existence. <clears throat> uh, so, but if you don't accept or don't recognize, if you are not aware of these limitations, then you commit a big crime, which is uh, epistemological transgression. Uh, so let's say sense perception has a particular domain where it's good to use sense perception. But if you use sense perception uh, in alam al the malakut, then you are doing intellectual transgression uh, because sense perception is useless in that uh, domain. Uh, so the train of prophetic knowledge is beyond the intellect and it informs us about the higher level of existence. Uh, uh, so that's the contribution of prophetic knowledge because uh, that high level of existence is beyond our reason and sense uh, perception. So Ibn Haldun writes, intellect is a correct scale, however, the intellect should not be used to weigh such matters as the oneness of God, the other worlds, the truth of prophecy, the real character of divine attributes, 
or anything else that lies beyond the level of the uh, intellect. Uh, so, uh, uh, so intellect is good, but it has limits. Uh, one might compare it with a man who sees a scale in which gold is being weighed and wants to weigh mountains in that uh, small uh, scale. Uh, uh, so how is this thinking ability, Fikir uh, and Ilm Imran related to uh, each other? Uh, so uh, Ibn Haldun argues that thinking is the beginning of human actions. Thinking is the beginning of new knowledge. Uh, so these uh, human actions, you know, they are related to the emergence of civilizations. So when civilizations emerge, you know, uh, new uh, actions emerge. But to be able to do that, you need thinking. So thinking makes possible, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to produce uh, human uh, actions. Thinking makes possible to produce new uh, knowledge. Uh, so actions uh, are related to the emergence of civilizations, uh, al-Umran, this part of social ontology, and new knowledge uh, is related to the emergence of sciences and crafts that emerge in uh, civilizations. Uh, so uh, this multiplex uh, epistemology uh, of Ibn Khaldun uh, uh, has implications on his political uh, theory. According to Ibn Khaldun, for instance, there are three types of uh, politics. Uh, there is uh, natural politics, uh, rational politics, and religious politics. Uh, but uh, politics may not exactly translate his concept of mulk. So the natural politics or natural political power, uh, it causes the masses to act as required by purpose and desire. But uh, rational politics, as uh, al uh, causes the masses to act as required by their intellect by their rational insight into the means of furthering their worldly interest and avoiding anything that's harmful. And then siyasa uh, al or al-khilafa causes the masses to act as required by religious insight into their interest in the other world as well as in this world. Uh, so you see that uh, Ibn Khaldun, you know, uh, uh, reflects a multiplex idea of politics. There is uh, rational politics, there is religious politics, and also natural uh, politics uh, or natural political uh, power. So these different types of ruling are informed by Ibn Khaldun's multiplex epistemology. If he had not recognized divine revelation, as a source of knowledge, he wouldn't have made this classification. Because you see that he accepts religious uh, uh, politics, rational politics, and natural uh, politics uh, or political uh, power. So this is a uh, multiplex and uh, theory of, uh, of politics. Uh, so these different types of ruling are informed by Ibn Khaldun's multiplex epistemology, uh, uh, and uh, and it reflects that he accepts reason as a source of knowledge and divine revelation as another source of uh, knowledge, and also this natural uh, way of uh, uh, doing things, uh, uh, innate innate knowledge. Uh, 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 so from this uh, perspective, Ibn Khaldun you know, talks about a rule of man and rule of law. Uh, 
some useful hints from uh, Ibn Khaldun to the students about knowledge. So this is a very interesting paragraph from the Muqaddime of uh, Ibn Khaldun. So he wrote, I would like to read it as it is uh, translated. I wish I could read from the Arabic, uh, but uh, our audience understand only the English one. If you are afflicted by such difficulties and hampered in your understanding of the problems by misgivings or disturbing doubts in your mind, cast them off. Discard the waves of words and obstacles of doubts. So this is a very interesting sentence. I really like it. Discard the waves of words and, and the obstacles of doubts. So words, they sometimes become like a whale. You know, uh, you get you know, preoccupied with those words and they uh, cover the truth uh, behind them. So uh, don't get, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, blinded by the words, uh, focus on the uh, truth or the reality beyond words. Uh, discard the ways of words and the obstacles of doubts. Leave all the technical procedures and take refuge in the realm of the natural ability to think given to you by nature. You know, so your futra you know, has given to you a natural ability to think about these things. Uh, so you don't need to rely on, uh, uh, on formal uh, logic or formal uh, 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 formal ways of thinking. Let your speculation roam in it and let your mind freely delve in it according to whatever you desire to obtain from it. Set foot in the places where the greatest thinkers before you did. Entrust yourself to God's aid as in, as in his mercy he aided them and taught them what they did not know. If you do that, God's helpful light will shine upon you and show you your objective. Inspiration will indicate to you the middle term which God made a natural requirement of the process of thinking as we have stated. So he's talking about the chaos, uh, the middle term. Uh, uh, at that particular moment, return with the uh, middle term to the molds and forms to be used for the arguments. Uh, dip it into them and give it its due of the technical norm of logic. So logic is also uh, important, but not everything. Yeah. Then clothe it with the forms of words and bring it forth into the world of spoken utterances, firmly geared and soundly constructed. Uh, so this is very interesting uh, you know, citation from uh, Ibn Khaldun and his uh, and analysis of like how knowledge is produced is very uh, interesting. Uh, he looks at the inner aspects uh, of it. Uh, all right, we stop here, inshallah ta'ala, and you continue with your uh, questions. Uh, questions, comments, objections, you are free. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the uh, very enlightening uh, lecture on Ibn Khaldun's thought on um, um, ontology of Ibn Khaldun's uh, approach, actually. So, um, so yeah, this in this part, we'll be talking about mostly the comments and Q&A section. We hope uh, our audience have taken notes on the lecture and are prepared for the uh, for this session. Uh, this session will last up there around 30 to 45 minutes. So um, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, or if you have any comments or questions, you can leave it to the chat as well. So, Rubat, do you have anything to begin with? Uh, yes, I have a few um, questions, observations, uh, seeking of clarifications. So, I think one of the things that I um, that I was thinking about about the idea, um, like when we were talking about the epistemology. Um, uh, uh, 
as sorry i'm just uh, one minute just okay so uh we're talking about uh divine uh revelation to be a source of knowledge right yes now this is quite obvious to people who have already uh, accepted it or understood it and believed in it Mm -hmm. Now, okay. it seems to me from the Mutakallimin, when they're trying to uh, uh, like uh, argue for the validity of this epistemological source, they also use, they kind of seem to use uh, akal and, uh, and a bit of like uh, empirical uh, means as well. Is that, is that a true characterization, would you say, Krishan Turk? That yeah, yeah, that yeah, it's absolutely true uh, because uh, when you want to prove that Quran is the book of Allah Ta'ala, you cannot cite Quran as a delil. Absolutely. You, know, you have to cite, you know, uh, some external delil, external evidence first. Second, you know, uh, pure reasoning is the common ground between Muslims and non-Muslims. Right. Okay, so when you want to prove something to uh, a non-Muslim, you use pure rationality. As I have explained you know, in my uh, previous uh, presentations, so you just use pure rationality. That's the common ground, you know, because he uses his reason, you use your reason. He doesn't cite his sacred book. You don't cite your sacred book. Yeah. So that's the common ground for the whole uh, humanity. I call it pure rationality. So there are two types of uh, rationality. One is pure rationality, uh, and then the other one, re religious rationality. So religious rationality incorporates uh, sense perception using akal, uh, plus it adds wahi, the Quran and the hadith uh, in, uh, together. Uh, so, uh, so this is how uh, it works. Uh, uh, if you would allow me. Dr. Shantar, uh, we have seen uh, some descriptions in the end, very beautiful description of how Ibn Khaldun engages into, uh, you know, and, and just before that, you also mentioned uh, something about Ibn Khaldun's idea of the two facets of the soul uh, or the mind. Now, my question is, it almost seems to me that this is something that Ibn Khaldun derives from this kind of cash for uh, like, uh, it doesn't seem to be like it seems experiential would you agree with that like uh with what i've no 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 <laughs> okay. can you explain because, to me uh, this? because ibn khaldun is a multiplex scholar you know there are certain things like he derives from experimentation there are certain things you know he derives from like wahi and there are certain things he derives from keshif you know, uh, so he combines uh, all of them. That's the multiplex uh, perspective. You know, some people call him empiricist because he's using empirical methods, but it's not true. He uses empirical methods, but he's not empiricist in the sense that he does not try to, you know, uh, reduce everything to empirical research. He never makes a claim that the only valid legitimate academic knowledge is empirical knowledge. But right. you know, he uses you know, empirical knowledge as one of the knowledge he uses and he relies on. But also he uses like rational uh, knowledge. He uses uh, knowledge based on divine revelation and he uses knowledge based on this uh, tasawwuf uh, sources uh, as well because he has a book on tasawwuf uh, so, uh, uh, so let's not uh, think Ibn Khaldun just like the modern uh, scholars who accept only one type of uh, no knowledge as a valid academic knowledge and rejects all other types. <laughs> so Ibn Khaldun is more comprehensive. So to to characterize that, to uh, to check my understanding of what you just said. So basically, Ibn Khaldun would use the maratib of Lulum, all the uh, all the aspects of epistemology at different stages to come at this this like deep understanding of what he's describing that that would yes. probably be a better characterization right yes 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 exactly thank you very much sir. okay 
Thank you, Robert. I guess uh, we have a hand over here. Uh, Wazir Baksh, could you just please uh, uh, unmute yourself and please uh, ask a question? Uh, we can't we can't hear you. Uh, Wazir Baksh. Okay. Um, right. So we'll come back to him again uh, later on as well. Uh, I had a um, small question, Professor. Okay, we've got Farah Ahmed. Go ahead, Farah Ahmed. Assalamualaikum. Um, I was I was wondering if uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if Ibn Haldun brings um, brings a layer of creativity or imagination or aesthetic type knowledge into his um not, not just his epistemology but into his idea of the kinds of knowledge and operate how, how that might be operationalized within the political domain mm -hmm. yes uh, yeah this is a very good uh, question as i have mentioned in the uh, in the second type of uh, second and third type of knowledge uh, like uh, uh, I mean, in the first type, like where we collect images from nature, so there is no innovation, you know, uh, just imagination. And uh, like we observe uh, objects in the outside world and we collect images and we turn them into concepts. Uh, then innovation comes uh, when you relate these concepts to each other uh, to make a synthesis and analysis. Because let's say you have like 10,000 images, 10,000 concepts, you know, in your mind, and how you relate these concepts to each other, how you establish relationships, you know, among these uh, concepts, uh, then innovation comes uh, in that uh, phase. So some people, they are so innovative, you know, they discover relations. Uh, among uh, concepts other people can never think of, you know, then this is called innovation. This is called new idea. See what I mean? <laughs> so in the field of uh, uh, politics, as we have discussed, there is like natural politics, you know, uh, like you know, natural aspect of the political life, which is everywhere, but then there is rational politics. This is open to innovation and also uh, religious politics, digital political thought, as siyasa, as sharia. This also open to innovation through ijtihad, through uh, by using usul fiqh, people can make innovations within siyaset sharia. But of course, following this uh, method, uh, uh, not haphazard, uh, not uh, uh, random. Uh, uh, actually, all innovations follow some rules. You know, uh, innovations are not uh, are not uh, methodless. Uh, you know, uh, they are not uh, random. Uh, so there is a domain. You know, uh, uh, like or, or there is a type uh, of epistemology that allows people and encourages people to make innovations uh, uh, in uh, even Khaldun. Uh, Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for your question, and uh, thank you, Professor, for the uh, for the answer. And just to let everyone know that we have shared our uh, WhatsApp groups um, um, link in the chat uh, because we'll be sharing the slides of today's lecture and uh, recorded video and all those and for, for the upcoming uh, information on the upcoming lectures as well. So please feel free to join in our group for more information on the lectures. So we have uh, Wazir Baksh again. Uh, please, uh, could you unmute yourself and uh, please uh, uh, ask the question? Um, <clears throat> just two quick points. Um, the first point is that um, dealing with non-Muslims or anybody, there is a concept that only what comes um, from the West is authentic. And I believe um, it's time for us as people who have a different understanding of epistemology based on our faith, that we demonstrate that publicly. It's not what they call quote unquote scientific, um, is the truth. The second point I want to make is that Beethoven, the great most German musician, 
And those who study his life will see that the best music he made was during the time when he was deaf. How do you explain that rationally? And secondly, I can remember the scientist's name when I was in high school. Um, the guy was in his bathtub and then he discovered Eureka and he ran out and he was, and there was no rational scientific methodology that when he came to that truth that he found out in his bathtub. Um, so how do we explain these? So I believe what we need to do, we can use rational, but rational as Immanuel Kant says, um, has limitations, but we have to go beyond. And I think when we have to share our truth, we share it from the sources of knowledge that is we are exposed to. Mm -hmm. Alaikum salam. Uh, uh, as I have uh, showed uh, uh, in my slides that uh, Ibn Khaldun, actually uh, all other Muslim scholars also accept subjective sources of knowledge, like dreams, intuitions, inspirations, you know, uh, seeing things through the uh, uh, eye of the heart. Uh, they all accept uh, these sources of knowledge. This is scientific for us. <laughs> But the uh, positivist, uh, they accept only experimentation as a source of knowledge. The idealist, they accept only rational thinking as a source of uh, knowledge. Uh, so, uh, you know, from their perspective, the uh, examples you gave are unexplainable. But from multiplex perspective, it's easy because we accept in, uh, intuition as a source of knowledge anyway. So uh, it's not a problem, you know, uh, for for someone who accepts the multiplex epistemology to explain uh, that uh, you know sometimes people get knowledge through uh, through sources uh, outside uh, sense perception or reason, uh, maybe through uh, dreams, through uh, inspirations. Uh, through the eye of the heart, through some other spiritual experience, so it's uh, it's uh, it's it's quite uh, acceptable from the multiplex uh, perspective. Uh, so we have no difficulty, no challenge in explaining. But if you're a positivist, then you have big challenge to explain these things. Okay, um, we've got uh, two questions in the chat. The first one is from uh, Numan Siddiqui. Um, does uh, Ibn Khaldun shared the source of his understanding of different realms and ability of humans to transcend it from one to another. Uh, in other words, can we say he was Sahib cautious to actually experience different level of his understanding is based on his interaction with such individuals? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who are Sahib al -Kesh, they don't say, I am Sahib al -Kesh. You know, <laughs> you know uh, they say those who speak don't know, uh, those who uh, don't know, speak. <laughs> yeah. Those who don't know, uh, the, those who don't know, speak. Those who know, don't speak. Uh, so like uh, people who have cash, they usually never say, you know, they have cash. Uh, but Ibn Khaldun wrote uh, a book on Tasawwuf where he talks about cash, you know, uh, and uh, <laughs> it's quite possible that, you know, he was one of those uh, people you know, who had the blessing of uh, being uh, Ahlil uh, Keshf. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, this uh, Maratib al uh, perspective, this multiplex understanding of uh, epistemology is not unique to Ibn Khaldun. All our uh, ulama, all our scholars accept this multiplex uh, uh, perspective. You read any kalam book, any fiqh book, uh, you will see uh, like these are all listed as uh, sources of uh, knowledge. So it's general, and we are studying Ibn Khaldun as just an example, because he's a prominent uh, scholar, and uh, I am uh, he's like one of my favorite uh, scholars. Uh, that's why I want to like promote him. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, if you study Ghazali, it's the same thing. You know, Farabi in the same thing. Ibn Sina is the same thing. You know, Fahrettin Razi is the same thing. You know, uh, like Imam Shafi, Abu Hanif, uh, Ahmed bin Hanbel, they're all, they're all the same thing. 
like none of them reject dreams as a source of knowledge because dreams is in the Quran. You know, uh, like dream as a source of knowledge is mentioned in the Quran. How can a Muslim scholar or any ordinary Muslim can reject it? <laughs> See what I mean? Uh, so like the, this uh, ilham is also in the Quran, intuition mentioned in the Quran. So no sensible Muslim can reject uh, something like this. And actually, like uh, uh, this epistemology is grounded in the Quran and Hadith. You know, our ulama did not make it up from their own mind. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, extrapolated this uh, knowledge from the Quran and Sunnah. They just systematized it uh, 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 this way. Okay, excellent. There's another question from Elif. Uh, in previous slides, we saw that even Khaldun negates the use of intellect to support the truth of prophethood and oneness of God. But in today's world, there are many important works in the field of philosophy, of religion, to support rational, rationally the truth of prophethood and oneness of God. How can we, how can we explain this difference? No, uh, Ibn Khaldun does not negate uh, using uh, intellect to support the truth of prophethood and oneness of God, because this is done in Ilm Kalam. In Mikalam, uh, this is what they do. You know, they they try to prove rationally that there is God, there is Allah Taala. They try to prove rationally Tawheed, uh, that the Quran is the true book of uh, Allah Taala, and Muhammad Alayhi Salam is the messenger of Allah, and there is hereafter. So Il Mikalam and our philosophers, they try to prove these things uh, rationally. You know, using their uh, reason. So Ibn Khaldun is not uh, against uh, this. However, you know, they say this is not enough. This is not sufficient. This is only one level of knowledge. Perhaps, you know, uh, in previous uh, discussions, this is what I have uh, tried to uh, communicate, but maybe I couldn't communicate uh, properly. So he's not against the discipline of uh of uh, uh of ilm kalam or you know uh, or the philosophy but he's very critical of certain types of philosophy it's materialistic atheistic uh, philosophy so if philosophy or ilm kalam is instrumentalized you know to support some uh, heresy he's against that uh, but he's not against the philosophy uh, itself because he, uh, you know, he thinks, you know, uh, al hikma uh, and uh, he thinks ilm Umran is part of the al hikma you know, uh, so for you know, he names philosophy as al hikma and he names philosophers as al hukama So if they have wrong ideas, he criticizes them. But also, you know, you have to be very careful. You know, uh, sometimes uh, one scholar criticizes another one. It does not mean he completely, you know, rejects the work of that particular scholar. He was just on this particular point. Uh, so they had insaf. Uh, they were like fair. And they were very critical, but at the same time fair. Like let's say Imam Shafi criticized Abu Hanifa, but he's very respectful to Abu Hanifa at the same time. And he does not reject 100% everything uh, Abu Hanifa said. On particular issues, you know, and this is scholarly disagreement, which is very good, very healthy. You know, it should be there. Uh, and the same thing with uh, Ibn Khaldun, like on certain issues, he criticizes uh, philosophers, but doesn't, you know, uh, uh, abandon them uh, completely. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. We actually. Um... Uh, don't have uh, much hands and much queries in the in the chat or in the, uh, in, the in the participant among the participants. So, don't know if there is uh, much questions. Um, one question I have though, uh, yes, to put put forward, Professor, that you talked about uh, material world, knowledge of material world, the non-material world, and the divine world. These three level in multiplex uh, epistemology. Uh, um, so. And if we talk, if we talk about the um, modern uh, Western 
secular uh, knowledge uh, and sociology, we we seem to um, come across the these two level is there material world and non material world. But the divine world is missing, and the existence of soul is missing there. And but at the heart and soul of uh, Islamic epistemology um, is the is the presence of soul or the divine world. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to reconcile between this um, Eastern and Western um, you know, epistemology or knowledge uh, knowledge uh, paradigm? Is there any way that we can reconcile or you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the modern or postmodern uh, materialist, uh, whether materialist uh, or idealist, you know, reductionism, you know, uh, uh, is uh, very simple minded. You know, uh, they are reductionists. They try to reduce reality to a single level, whether material level or the ideal level. And also, they want to reduce. Uh, uh, knowledge into a single type of knowledge. This is, you know, a, you know, very primitive, very simple uh, approach to reality and knowledge. Uh, you know, uh, they have to expand their horizons, uh, and uh, there is like reaction to uh, classical uh, positivism, classical materialism, but then. This reaction went to other extreme. <laughs> you know, uh, now they say no knowledge, uh, you know, no truth. Uh, nothing is acceptable. Nothing is uh, proven. Uh, so that's another uh, extreme. Uh, so we need to help these people, you know, through a multiplex uh, perspective. That uh, the you know there is certain knowledge, but in a particular domain. And subjectivity, which is you know uh, advocated by postmodernity, it also has its level in this uh, multiplex uh, system. So uh, I believe uh, you know multiplexity will bring together you know uh, different approaches to uh, knowledge in this multiplex uh, system. So I mean, if you are empiricist, yes, we have a room for you, you know, in the multiplex system, but don't claim that uh, everything uh, must be known through empirical methods. Uh, you know, there is a domain where empirical methods are very useful. But if you try to use empirical methods in a domain where they are not applicable, you know, uh, you are doing epistemological transgression. I call this epistemological transgression. Uh, like uh, this empirical epistemology is good in one particular domain, the natural world. The material world, but if you use like uh, you know empirical methods to study the ruh, to study the metaphysical world, uh, to make statements about the hereafter, this is transgression. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you are supposed to use this uh, tool in a particular domain. You are using outside uh, the proper uh, domain, and actually, Imam Ghazali's critique of the philosophers. You know the Greek philosophers and their followers uh, may be explained with this concept of epistemological transgression, methodological transgression, because his critique was, you know, he was saying these philosophers may know what's happening in the natural world through their empirical and their ration, rational research. So if they make a statement about natural world. Uh, the material world, we take it seriously and we check whether it's evidence-based or not. If it's evidence-based, then we accept. Mm -hmm. But if they make a statement about the metaphysical world, mm -hmm. the hereafter, uh, God, we reject from the very beginning because there is no way for them to know through empirical or rational methods the metaphysical world. <laughs> So it's, this is what I call, you know, epistemological transgression. You know, they transgress the borders, you know, where it's appropriate, you know, to use uh, sense perception or to use uh, reason. So in that domain, the metaphysical domain, the hereafter, you know, you need divine revelation. You know, your mind uh, wouldn't uh, tell you uh, anything about it, but your mind may tell you that it exists. Like God exists, 
the hereafter exists, but that that's you know that's the most uh, your mind can help you uh, understand. But when it comes to uh, like what's there, you know, uh, your mind will not be able to uh, 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 you know uh, to tell you anything about that. So. Just to just to add to that, uh, Professor, um, I, I just have uh, found few lectures. For example, one is about what is from Professor Halil Bakte, and another is Professor um, uh, Eric Ringmer. They are talking about uh, uh, the limitation of Western and uh, Eurocentric based uh, uh, this uh, knowledge based paradigm. And uh, it seems that the multiplex ontology or multiplex approach of Ibn Khaldun is gaining ground. Do, how, do you, how do you see that uh, the momentum going? Do you see in the next two, three years or so, we will see uh, more researchers and scholars from the Western world will come forward and acknowledge the limitation of the uh, Western paradigm? Yeah, I think so, because this is the only way uh, you know, for, to exit the existing crisis. You know, now the Western civilization is in crisis. The ontology, epistemology, morality, ethics, it's all in crisis. This uh, and the, their relationship with the environment made it, uh, you know, um, uh, very explicit that they have a problem. <laughs> you know, uh, look what they have done to the world. Mm -hmm. They brought to the world to the edge of extinction. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, the life of the world may be terminated. It may come to an end because what because of what they have done uh, to the globe. Uh, so, what kind of ontology is behind that? What kind of epistemology is behind that? What kind of methodology, concept of science is behind that? So, they are all questioning you know, these things. But unfortunately. They don't have an alternative. And we are privileged. We have an alternative. Why? Because we have Islamic heritage. So the Islamic intellectual heritage helps us, you know, uh, to, uh, to address these questions uh, and offer solutions uh, to them. So that's our uh, advantage. Uh, and uh, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we can plausibly, intelligibly uh, introduce uh, this multiplexity which we inherit from intellectual tradition to the whole world, they will recognize that there is a solution uh, in this and they'll be attracted uh, to it. Uh, Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was uh, the uh, last question. And uh, with that, we are about to close the session tonight. Uh, we thank uh, Professor Dr. Rajiv Shantuk uh, for the slides and presentation. And we thank you all for taking part in uh, tonight's session. Just to let you know, our next lecture will be on uh, Tuesday, 21st March. Uh, and the title would be Ibn Khaldun on Method, Multiplex Methodology. So we again, thank you so much for joining in. We hope to see you in our next lecture. With that, uh, we're closing our session tonight. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Fi amanillah. Fi amanillah.